On with tonight, though, our next guest is without a doubt one of the most recognisable figures, faces and voices in Manchester. He's an author, he's a journalist, he's a musician and he's also one of our favourite people on the Manchester music scene. Studio audience, we make some noise for our guest on Mancunia TV tonight, the one and only John Robb. Good evening, everybody. I'm just thinking, and this picture's quite weird, isn't it? It's like, it's like Tony, if he was Antonia. It's like a transvestite version of Tony, isn't it? I mean, it's a great painting, but it's kind of odd, isn't it? Is it something you'd have on your wall? No. Oh, right, fair enough then, fair enough. <laughs> Although it is a good painting, it's a piece of art, it's just um, odd the twist in it. Yeah. Anyway, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on Mancunia TV with us tonight. <laughs> I, I, knew that, I knew the artist would be in here. That's why I said it was a good painting. <laughs> what would you have said if you want here? Anyway, let's crack on. Right, right I... so, John Rob, right, we've got 10 minutes, which is nowhere near enough to talk about your life, so we're going to fit as much in as we can in 10 minutes. Right, first memories of music. Uh, first memories of music is probably uh, Pinky and Perky because I'm 61 now, so I'm, I'm, I'm a 60s child. I can remember the 1960s. So I remember Pinky and Perky doing the poppets on television, speeded up little squeaky vocals. And proper music, probably I can, I can remember the Stones doing Brown Sugar on top of the pop. So, but I was more of a glam rock kid. So when glam rock started, that was totally my thing. Yeah. You were listening to stuff like the Stones and glam rock, and obviously you ended up uh, going into punk with the membranes. What turned you on to punk? I was, it was just amusing. Everything about it was so amazing. You know, I, this is so Blackpool because I'm from Blackpool, so I'm a bit naff. I'm not a cool city kid at all. We've adopted you. <laughs> well, no, it's great. And I love Manchester. It's the best city in the world, you know, because to, to, it accepts everybody. That's what's great about Manchester. Yeah. Tony, uh, not Antonio, but Tony, was he always, I used to bump in the street the whole time. You have massive arguments about everything, but he always said Manchester's strength was a city of immigrants. And that's what's great about it, isn't it? Everybody's from somewhere else, but when you're here, we're all together as one. The Melbourne Pot, just talk about that that guy there so yeah so um what was the question i've lost track i've gone off for a mad tangent i was here. just saying about you know the punk thing what turned oh, you punk. Punk? oh no so um yes yeah, so a punk because i was into glam rock and then there's this weird bit for two years and nothing seemed to happen and then i was reading the music papers and then yeah because black was so naff so the only place to hang out was the ice ice skating ring so we used to go ice skating and they would play punk records there in 76 so they played uh, Anarchy in the UK, The Damned and the Ramones, because that's all the punk records in the whole world at that time, because nobody knew about the Saints then. And it was amazing. And there was a massive fight on the ice. We go, wow, what is this music? It's so fucking exciting. It was like mind-blowing. It wasn't like you could look it up, was it? You, you had no idea what it was. And then it started... You, I was reading the music papers even then, and so you were reading about this thing coming. In fact, I saw the band's pictures before I'd even heard them, and I knew what they sounded like, because they looked so linear and so exciting and so wild and crazy. You knew what the music was like, yeah. Just listening to you now, you could hear your passion as a kid getting into music and the punk and all that kind of stuff. At that point in your life, you were forming bands, the membranes come along. Which direction did you want your life to go at that point? Oh, I never thought about that. At school, when they did that, you know, I don't know if they still do it, but they do that careers thing, you know, where they test people out for what career they want, and they said I was the most hopeless case they'd ever met because I didn't really want to work for anybody else. I want to do my own thing. But now you can plot that out, but then there was no option to do your own thing, but you just did it anyway, yeah. didn't you, you know? So it wasn't like we made a band to be have a career, which is probably a stupid move, isn't it? We just made a band, and we had no idea what to play. I remember the first gig we played, and we didn't even know how to tune up. We just put the machine heads in a row, We'd never been in an amp before. We just plugged in the amp. It's totally out of tune. That's punk, yeah. though, isn't it? Well, it was, in, in a way, in its purest form. We were completely DIY. A bit like this thing here. It's DIY. I mean, it's much more professional than we were. But I, I think all the best culture, in fact, every, all the best stuff comes out of DIY. You know, instead of, you know, like, like when, a, when a town, like, say, like a town, I went to Stoke the other day to do a talk there, and they were waiting for the government to subsidise the town so they could get back on their feet again. God, the fucking government don't care about you. Do it DIY punk style. It's, it's difficult, but don't sit around waiting. If you sit around waiting, then you die. It's, you know, you're, you're talking about like life there in the late seventies, and the fact now you look at Mancunia TV, it is grassroots rock and roll television, and it's still important forty years on. Oh, completely. I mean, stuff like this is amazing, isn't it? And I think one of the great things about the internet, it's it's taken the control of culture back to the people who make the culture, isn't it? Or the people who love the culture, because you don't have to make any culture to, to facilitate the culture, do you? You know, you don't have to be a musician to create stuff like this. The creativity is actually creating a space or spaces like this. And you see them in quite a lot of different places now in the last 15, 10, 15 years. But this is an amazing setup in here. Yeah. 
It's great to have you here. So you're a punk rocker, you formed a band, you got into the music, the membranes come along, and everyone in the music scene knows you for that. But obviously everyone in the world of music knows you as a journalist and an author. When did you get into that side of the industry? Well, punk rock was like, I remember it came in and we thought, wow, wow, it's so exciting, this music. But then we thought, wait a minute, the message was you could actually do it. You could make it, you know, stuff. And I remember somebody brought Spiral Scratch, Buzzcocks, you know, first EP came out January 77, brought it to school. And we go, wow, that looks homemade. You can actually make a record. So that, that's where we got that. Like, like every 16-year-old who's playing the guitar in the country thought that as well. Then somebody brought Sniffing Glue along, which is Mark Perry's punk fans, and we thought, look at that. that, that you can't, I've got a typewriter, but how do they make more than one of them? And somebody said it's a photocopy, and we go, what's one of those? And we learned basically like that. We didn't ever learn what to do. Like now you can go, and it's great now, you can go to college and learn how to do everything, but we never learned how to do anything. I mean, I still can't really play properly. I just played the things that sound right to me, and I still can't really write properly. I just write the words that come into my head, and I'm sure that's not how you're meant to do it. You know, so it's... But it you know, works in the music industry, in the music world, loves you for it. I think you've done about 20 books now, is that right? It feels like it. I hate writing books. It's I think such a I think drag. you've done something like that. It's How did you end up getting into, you know, you've wrote books about, you know, Tim Burgess and Stone Roses and all this. How did you end up getting to meet all these people? To, well, we're, we're all in the same rehearsal know? rooms. The Roses were rehearsing next door to us before they'd even done a gig. Next to the membranes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we thought, God, they look pretty hard there. And they'd kind of go in like that. And then one day I broke a guitar string and I had to go to ask them for a guitar string. So I knocked on the door, they were the door. And we started chatting with them and they were going, we thought you were all like mad psychopaths, you know. And, well, and we were the bigger band then. That's the weird thing. We, we were number five in the indie album charts and they were like a local band and they were looking at us like... They we were, were probably like, thinking the same about you. <laughs> well, no, they, they thought we were like quite a big band and we were looking at... And we thought, well, they're obviously some kind of cool looking local band that look pretty hard. But they thought we were some big band who looked like nutters. And then we, then we got on them really well, you know. And, uh, and then I think that story changed a bit, didn't it? Because they ended up being super enormous, super important, and we just kind of plodded along somewhere on hey, the bottom. Look at the longevity of the bands, though. You know, you're still yeah, out I don't, and... I don't see the longevity of it as being a credit. Yeah. You know, it's uh, wouldn't it be great if it was easier? You know, and of course, it's never easy making music. And in fact, I think the best thing and the best bottom line of anything, if you've got space to be creative, you know, and that's such a luxury, isn't it? Yeah, you could actually do. If, I, if we're starting the next record now and we can make it any sound like any way we want, because if nobody else likes it, it doesn't really matter because we haven't, we haven't got a, a great career to throw away, you know. <laughs> You're underselling yourself there, John. Well, it's kind of true, isn't it? And, and it's a luxury position because you, with our kind of music, I suppose you would call it art, rock, or whatever, you just make stuff that appeals to you, you know. So you have this amazing career, you know, in, with the band, you know, the writing, the journalism and stuff like that. One thing I wanted to touch upon that I like asking a lot of musicians about is March 2020 comes along, there's a pandemic nobody expected. Did your life change much at that point? Because you'd had a life in music and then it stopped. Did your life change much personally? Yeah, it got really busy. That was a weird thing, you know. So because I wasn't on tour and spending all day booking vans and trying to round the band up and get them into the van, and, and it takes a lot of time being in a band, which is okay. It's still better than a, having a job you hate and that. But I had all day to do stuff, and I'm just kind of person as idea after idea. So I thought this idea of making... I looked at Boris Johnson, like I thought, God, that guy is so out of his depth. You know, the best education you could possibly get. hasn't got a clue what he's doing. And then, and you know, we, of course, we all know this, but all the smart people are living a mile away from me or on the council state, but they don't get in, they don't get the chance to run it. So I thought, how can That's we... That's a great way of looking well, at it. Well, that, how yeah. can we connect this all up? So we had this, I had this mad idea, and I'm really into a lot of green stuff. So at that point in time, about two weeks before, I'd gone to see this guy called Dale Vince, who runs a, Britain's biggest green energy company called Ecotristy, and Dale had been a traveller for 15 years living on a bus, and now it's worth a billion quid because he builds windmills. You know, by mistake, he's still a traveller at heart. Yeah. So, and he was going to do that tour, Massive Attack, the Zero Carbon tour. So I went to interview him about that. And then I had all those other ideas because it's... And I thought, well, you know, me and Dale were talking about green populism because green stuff is poncy, it's chorn, isn't it? But how do you get it so everybody can be involved and everyone gets paid properly and get some out of it, you know? So it's not just people, who, you know, it's not nicey nicies for everybody. But then I thought, why don't we get an education thing where we train everybody up in the jobs and get them paid properly to do them and also run the company. So we started doing that and that took it. And still, and we're almost nearly ready to make it start. So I got went down that. Well, the weirdest thing was I started speaking to all these people who run really big companies and they're all music heads. They go, oh, I remember you. I saw you play in Hull in 1984 and it's like some person runs a massive construction company now. So it's actually a lot easier 
to connect in the world outside music. So, but applying the principles of pop culture and punk rock DIY, basically. So that sounds dead exciting. July 21 comes along, things sort of go back to normal and that kind of stuff. What happens next for the membranes? What you got planned for the band? Well, it's funny, actually, when he went back to normal, they, they put us back on the naughty seat in about six weeks, didn't they? But put Manchester back into, like, uh, the, the bottom tier again, didn't they? Because they're scared. What the fuck were all that about? Well, I'm actually funny, I saw Andy, Andy Byrne doing his speech. I was just cycling past, and I saw him get the message off his mate, off his, uh, his PA, Kevin. I saw him, like, really going fucking mad, and he went to the telly, and he was a great speech and that as well. What's next? The membranes, we're going to make an album, we're going to tour around Europe, the Stranglers in the autumn. And wow, that would be good. Oh, they're mate, well, They're the greatest band, aren't they? You know, I, think, yeah. I love the Stranglers. You know, psychedelic, angry, psychotic punk, you know. Yeah. It's, what, how could it get any better than that, you know? And you still can't mess with JJ, even though he's 70. You won't want to get a scrap with him. <laughs> uh, you've had an amazing career. Is there any sign... It's of... not a career. It's just a random load of coincidences. It's, you've you know, worked your way through you... life. <laughs> well, it is, it's, it's a blag and it's a hustle, isn't it? But, but I'm lucky. I'm a really lucky person. I've never had a job, but I just do what I like. It is yeah. brilliant. And that brings me on to the question. Are you ever going to write a book about John Robb? People ask me, but I, I, you've got to have a proper story. I tell you, you you've a got book. a mega story. No, but I tell you, you should really write the book as Bruce Mitchell. You know, if anybody knows Bruce, Bruce was in Manchester before. He was here in Manchester the night rock and roll arrived, and there's a riot in the street. He watched it. He provided the PA and the lights for the Pistols gig. He did the Roses gig. I saw him three days ago. Said, "How you doing, Bruce?" And he goes, "I'm all right, kid." He still calls me kid because he's 82 now, Bruce. I go, "What have you been up to?" He goes, "I've just been down at Blue Dot setting up the PAs," and he, he sets them up himself. And he's like, and he's he's dressed he's smart, and he's he's a beat. He's original beats. He used to go. They used to go to the Clarendon pub, which is not there anymore, underneath the Mancunian Way, yeah. to the uh, to the jazz nights. And they used to wear all the Ivy League stuff. And he told me about the trousers, the creases, the clothes, the socks. I go, fucking hell, Bruce. You, you, every time I talk to you, there's a chapter of a book. Yeah, it's amazing. You've I, just totally swerved the question, John, right? But, <laughs> no, but I'm just going to tell you, he, he saw Jimi Hendrix's first gig in Blackpool, in, in, in uh, Manchester. He, he told me about that the other night, the MDH Hall. I thought, wow, Jim, I didn't know Jimi Hendrix played the MDH. And he went to meet him in the car park afterwards, and he met Howling Wolf. And I was going, well, every story is total gold. He's yeah. met everyone. But, you know, but I, I will get round to it. Joking yeah. aside, I mean, you've done your fair bit of meeting people and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think that a John Robb book must be due. But your own story always seems completely nothing. Thing, don't it? Yeah, but you've got a lot it. of fans who, you know, for your journalism, the band and stuff like that, and, you know... I will write it down sometime. There's yeah. bits, I mean, yeah. That's on camera, innit? He's going to write his book down. Yeah, that's done that, innit? <laughs> what about next? I do believe, if my notes are correct, you have got another book coming out next year. Is that right? Well, I've got four on the go. There's a book about the history of goth culture. Right. So that's just waiting to get it edited. It's nearly edited. Um, there's a book of... Um, Oh, God, what's it called? Simon Taylor, you know, the uh, photographer. He drives Barney around these days and he drove the four around for 10 years and came out the other side relatively undamaged, which is quite amazing. And he's got a book of all his photographs. He's got great photographs of all the live gigs in Manchester from 87 to 92. So I went, so I'm writing the captions on him. You know what's really mad? And this just showed, this is an indictment of my life. I, I was at every single gig that he had a picture of. There's even a picture of my shoulder or the back of my head and some of them thought, oh my God, what a wasted youth that was, wasn't it? <laughs> well, that wasn't even young then. I was about 30 even then. So that, that's coming out. And I'm doing a book with McGee. So it's, um, you know, Sean Ryan did his book about how to be an Yeah, of course, star. yeah. McGee's doing a book about how to run a record label. So I'm kind of writing with Alan. That'd which is a great brilliant. story. I mean, I, well, I know McGee before creation, so... Yeah. I remember when he was like this just mad Scottish kid who just wanted us to play, persuaded us to play in London because we didn't, were not going to play in London at all. So I remember talking to him about, you know, let's do, you should do a record label and all that kind of stuff. So we go back a long, long way. And McGee's amazing, you know. Yeah. It's, still, it's brilliant to see how passionate you still are oh, he's about still pa all your forthcoming projects. He's, you know, he's a multimillionaire. He could go and sit in his house, you know, and all that. He's earned that, every penny that he's earned. But he's more passionate about young bands, you know, and how he can make the make it. Not, not even for business, just because he's got that compulsive drive to make things happen. Talking yeah. about new music, the new music scene at the moment, in my opinion, is up there with the best it's been for a long, long, long time. Do you follow any of the new bands at the moment that are going on around Manchester? Is it something you keep an eye on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes, I'm still... I've got that compulsive thing, you just want to be the first. Yeah. <laughs> so there's loads of great bands, but that band's super great, aren't they? Yeah, the thing is a name, because there's a couple of other bands called Soup, and they? they put an exclamation mark on it. But they're amazing, they're young as well, they're about 18, 19, so that's really, that's really good. It's great it? to see you still keeping involved with the new bands and well, stuff I, as well. Well, I think most people do. You, you go to gigs, it's not just me. There's, there's quite a lot of old duffers who still like re engage with music, because I don't see it as young and old. I mean, I, yeah. when I was 16, I, I like I like all the... I, liked, I loved Howling Wolf, you know, and he'd been yeah. dead for years, and I like 
I like, I got really into jazz even then, not because it was clever, made us clever, just because he thought, wow, Charlie Mingus is completely insane. It's tough music, you know. I, th I think it's great though, because all the new bands and the up and coming, you know, creative people in Manchester see that someone like yourself who's been there, done it, been around, still supports that music. So I think that's brilliant that you do. Well, I think that's important. Well, it is important. I think musicians do support each other though. And that's another great thing about the city, because you go to other town cities and you say, what's the scene like around here? And they go, oh, we all hate each other. You go, well, it's never been. Of course, there's sometimes a little bit of tension, but generally all the bands yeah. We all know each other, you know, it's, it's a family, isn't it? Yeah. So like when Paul Ryder died, which is really sad, it felt like somebody like your family had died. Even though you hadn't seen him for ages, it felt like a cousin, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, he was know? a great man, yeah. 100%. Oh, he's amazing. And I'm one amazing band and they yeah. don't get enough of the credit because they were game changers. And what, what an off-the-wall band that really was. I mean, if I was saying to the other day, some, some mate man I was talking about, he said um, he didn't really, he, he could never get his head around them and said, listen to it as avant-garde music because they're amazing pop bands. Yeah. But they're also like Captain Beef or on acid. They're just completely out there, aren't Different, they? Different, do their own thing, no, yeah. Utterly original. I can't think of a band that sound like them before. Those yeah. early gigs, even right to the, now, it's a very polished great hit set. But what a great hit set they got. But an amazing band. And Sean is an amazing lyricist, and he, he has no idea how good he is. Yeah, we definitely, and we talk about poetry and stuff like that on here, and it's true, that's exactly what he is, isn't it? You know what I mean? Completely. And... Yeah. and Antonia. <laughs> what did he used to call him? He used to like compare... I bet that picture's gone for the next show. <laughs> <laughs> he used to compare him to like like poets like Yeats or something and I'm, I'm sure we go pretend because then Sean's way smart and he's letting on. He go, I don't even know what you're talking about and all that. But he's the equal then. Why should something we have now or yeah. then not be equivalent to something from 200 years ago? Yeah. I don't... You know, why, why, should, why do people always say young bands now you can never be as good as the Beatles were? Well, that's bullshit because it's all... When they came out, people saying you're not as good as Elvis, and when he came out, he wasn't as good as Frank Sinatra. It's a great way of looking at it. And do you know what? The John Robb story, we can't have 10 minutes. We need, like, a day to do it. And you need to get that book wrote, definitely. Not another book. <laughs> uh, but it is good to, it's good to see you still doing stuff. All of John's information, of course, uh, you can find out across all of the internet. And we look forward to seeing you on tour with the Stranglers as well. But it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us at Mancunia TV. John Robb.